Welcome to the Teachers Need Teachers podcast, where we help new and beginning teachers navigate through those crazy first years of teaching so you can maintain your sanity and personal life. Here's your host, Kim LaPree. Welcome to the Teachers Need Teachers podcast, episode number 33. I'm your host, Kim LaPree, and this is the podcast for new and beginning teachers who don't want to just survive those first few years, but actually thrive. Now, I'm really excited for this post-Thanksgiving episode. I can't believe it's episode 33. Well, if you had told me that I would have done 33 episodes since June, I would have said to you, yeah, that sounds about right. (laughs) I'm actually someone who's pretty ambitious and I like a good challenge, especially when I see the value of it and I see that it helps other people. So I know 33 isn't a big number like 50 or 100, but it feels tangible. And I'm really glad that you came out here to hang out with me today and listen to what I have to share, because today I have something that's a little bit on the controversial side in the sense that I've had conversations about this topic with a lot of my colleagues, and pretty much we're divided in terms of people who agree and don't really agree with me. So I'd love to get your take on this. And one thing I wanted to ask you guys before I delve into this topic is I'd love to know who you are, who my listeners are. Some of you have already come over to the Teachers Need Teachers Facebook group, and I think that's awesome. But I would absolutely love it if you would send me an email and just go to Kim at TeachersNeedTeachers.com and introduce yourself. Tell me about your educational journey, where you're at in terms of teaching and what it is that you're struggling with and what brought you to my podcast. I would love to know who you are. I will give you a shout out if you want one. Um, Make sure you let me know because maybe you don't want me to mention your name or maybe I'll just mention your first name. But in any case, I want to know who you are and how I can better serve you. And I'd love to know what topics you'd like me to cover on the podcast. But first, a message from the Education Podcast Network. My name is Jennifer Kronk from the Assist Learning Podcast. I'm a proud member of the Education Podcast Network, just like the show you're listening to right now. The opinions expressed are those of the individual hosts. Make sure you check out all the other great podcasts at edupodcastnetwork.com and get ready because the learning begins in three, two, one. So, as I mentioned in the introduction, today's topic can be controversial and not because it's, you know, should you give zeros or should you not give zeros, but it's a little bit similar. And so I guess the best way that I can put this is the question of how much work should you put in in order to get your students to do their work? In other words, how hard should you work if they don't want to work? And I've heard all sides of the argument online and in person where some teachers just feel like they have to really push students whether or not they want to learn because it's their job. And then on the other side of the argument is it's not our learning. It's their learning. It's not our job to make them want to learn. They should want to learn. And I'm sure you've heard that or thought that before, that students should want to learn. They should take ownership of their learning and it's not up to us to make them learn. So before I tell you which side that I'm on, I want to give you a scenario that happens quite a bit in my classroom. So I have a student named Eric and Eric just likes to sit there and stare. He doesn't like to do any work. He just sits there. He doesn't get out his materials unless I ask him personally after I've asked the class. He doesn't write anything down unless I ask him personally to write something down. And he just really hopes, I can tell, he really hopes that if he just sits there long enough that I'm going to give up on him. Does that sound familiar? 
Do you have at least one student in your class who does that? Maybe they even slouch in their seats or they kind of have this, you know, constant eye roll whenever you ask them to do something. And they're just pretty much putting up walls and barriers so that they can make it difficult for you. And eventually you're going to throw your hands up in the air and give up. And I'm sure right now you are envisioning at least one of these students that you have right now. So here's the thing. I don't give up on Eric. In fact, I think I kind of annoy Eric because I go as far as to take a stool and sit next to his desk and I'll I'll fold my hands in my lap and I'll just look at him. And it kind of creeps him out, I can tell, but I will prompt him until he gets some work done. I'll ask him questions and even if he says, I don't know, then I'll say, well, what do you mean you don't know? How about this? Have you never had a situation like this? Have you never had a situation like this? So I will become practically a prosecutor here and get him to finally say, yes, actually, that is something that applies to me. I will write that down for the quick write. And he doesn't even use all those words, but he'll say, yeah, I guess. And then he'll write his response to the quick write. And the same goes for pretty much every assignment that we do. I will have to sit down and I will have to look at him until he gets something done. Now, this does not happen for the entire year. In fact, it only took one quarter of using this method before Eric finally knew I was going to head over to him. And because he was so tired of me sitting there staring at him, he just did it. And while his work may not have been phenomenal, while it may have been the minimum amount of work, I finally got to the point with him where he just did it. And if anything, to avoid me, maybe he actually finally figured out that he needs to do this work. I doubt it. But at the very least, he's doing it to avoid me bugging him. So now maybe you can see which side I'm on in terms of this argument of whose responsibility is it for students to learn? Now, some teachers have told me that you can't make a student learn. I kind of have to disagree. I can make a student learn. I can be totally in mom mode when I'm teaching in the sense that I will nag until the student does work. And if I see a student do the bare minimum, barely did anything to demonstrate any sort of learning, I will figure that out and I will get them to do even more work, to flesh out the details, to add an explanation in a paragraph. And I don't let it slide. And because I'm such a ninja at that in terms of I know when students aren't putting forth their best effort, then I can catch it. And after a while, just like Eric, they just sort of want to avoid being bugged by me. And maybe that sounds terrible to you because you're thinking, well, I don't have time for that. It's not my responsibility and it's not my job to sit there and bug them and make them learn. These kids need to take responsibility for their learning. Now, when I hear this, I kind of think of my doctor. So if I was doing things that were completely dangerous to my health and my doctor didn't even care and he just said, well, it's your body, it's your life. If you want to poison yourself with drugs and alcohol and live a short life, then that's up to you. Go ahead. If he never sat there and tried to nag and annoy me by reminding me that what I'm doing is unhealthy, I honestly think I would get a different doctor. Or think of a firefighter who says, well, you know, you should have had a fire extinguisher and you shouldn't be smoking in bed. So I'm not going to fight the fire for your house. I'm not going to put out the fire because you should have known better. It's your responsibility. And I know these may seem extreme and you're thinking, well, these people save lives. So it's their job to do that. Well, my friends, We save lives. And I don't mean that in a corny way. We save lives. Don't sell yourself short if you don't think that you are saving a child's life when you educate them. You really are. And so it it is our responsibility to get them to learn. 
Now, it's not always easy because maybe you seem to have a room full of Eric's and all of them are slouching in their seat and nobody wants to learn or it seems like they don't want to learn. And perhaps you're thinking, well, you know what? Let those students fail as a natural consequence of their lack of effort. Or maybe you're thinking, well, you know, teachers shouldn't care more than the student about how much they learn and about their grade. And I honestly think that the students who get you to think that are getting off easy. I think that the beliefs and attitudes of these teachers actually motivate those students to do less and less because Eric would prefer that I leave him alone so that he can space out, make faces at his friends across the room, and get away with doing nothing. He doesn't actually care if he fails. And, you know, based on conversations I've had with him, with his parents and his counselor, he doesn't even care if his parents get upset about it. He just doesn't want to do the work. But you know what? He's not going to get away with that. Not in my classroom. Uh Uh-uh. Now, In my classroom, my sole purpose is to make sure that everybody learns. So even the student who has missed more days than they've actually attended school, even if I have five Eric's in my room, they all have to learn as long as they are under my watch and in my classroom. So I am really passionate and determined to ensure that every student learns And I literally cannot let them give up. I just can't. It's my job to make sure that they learned. Now, you know, maybe a student doesn't like being in my class. Maybe I don't like having that student in my class. Let's be honest. You know, we don't have to like every single student. So they don't have a choice. They end up in my class. I don't get to pick and choose who's in my class. But you know what I get to choose is whether or not I show up and do the job that I signed up for. And part of that job, or not even a part of that job, the majority of that job is ensuring that your students learn. And so to be in my classroom, to get this amazing knowledge and wisdom that I impart every day, I charge a price. And I charge a significant fee for my expertise, my amazing personality, my humor, and my ability to break down a concept for any learner. And you know what that price is? They have to produce some evidence of learning. And every student in my class has to pay up. So how far do I take this, you may be thinking. Well, I'm kind of a stalker. I know that sounds terrible. Or maybe you can call me a bounty hunter here. So I will email them. I will email their parents. I will call their parents. I will conference with them every time I see them. I will ask them to stay after class with me so they can get the work done. I will do whatever it takes to get the students to show evidence of learning. No matter how much they push back or try to avoid me, I will collect on every student. And I just, I squeeze everything I can from them until they produce some form of work, some evidence of learning, because I need to track their learning. I need to assess them. I need to determine how they're progressing. And I can't do that if they don't do any work. So guess what? I have to make them work. And my job isn't complete until I assess their progress in my class. Now, You may be thinking that I'm not holding students to a high enough standard by giving them chance after chance and me doing more work than them. It may seem like I'm doing more work than them. It feels like it. But you might think that I'm not holding them to a high standard. But I personally can't think of a higher standard than mandating that all students do their work no matter what. I mean, I'm getting paid to do my job. I'm not getting paid much, but I'm getting paid to do my job. And part of that job is to make sure they learn, even if they don't want to. I mean, come on, guys. These are kids we're talking about. Kids. As adults, when we have a job, we sign up for it. We go and we do our job or we get fired. Kids have to go to school. They have to show up, but they don't have to want to and they don't have to like it. Any type of work that they don't enjoy is usually met with resistance. You should come to expect that and you should be prepared with how to deal with that. 
And even if they're college bound high school students, they're still going to resist or begrudge the work that you give them if they don't feel that it's purposeful or if they don't enjoy it. Who cares? Do you think that a little defiance is going to keep me from getting my payout from these kids? No way. Now, I am on my students' case to the point that their only option is to work. And yes, there are the kids who, no matter how many detentions I assign or how many lunches I have them stay in with me or how many voicemails I leave to the parents, they still resist doing the work. Yep. And there are times when I want to give up. There's usually one or two every year that just, oh my goodness, they make my blood boil. And I really want to ignore them. And I just want to throw in the towel and say, fine, fine, I give up. But you know what? I honestly think that they want to do well. They want to please me, but something, some external situation, something is keeping them from doing the assignment. They could be really stubborn, but you know what? I'm pretty stubborn. In fact, I'm more stubborn. And so some of these students resent my stubbornness and I can see the annoyance in their eyes. And it just turns out that they'll be resigned to the fact that I'm not going to allow them to do nothing. I refuse to give up on them. And you may be tired of hearing me say how hard I work to get work out of students. But I want to drive the message home that because of my persistence, all of my students turn in their work. And some of my colleagues are even like, how do you get everyone to turn it in? Some of them get at least 10% of their students who just don't turn it in. And for me, it's because I won't let them leave unless they turn it in. I won't give them the option to not turn it in. The expectation is that they will do the work and they will turn it in. And after seeing my persistence with other students, all of my students now know that this is how it works in Miss LaPree's class. This is what you got to do, or she's going to bug you. She's going to sit in front of you and watch you work, which I think it kind of creeps them out, but it gets the point across just how important the work is. So I'm going to be real for a minute here. Not that I wasn't real, but there's going to be students who, no matter how they feel about you, they're going to resist all attempts to make them learn. I mean, that's just how it is. Just imagine having a group of students, they ignore your questions, they refuse to do homework, they challenge you to call their parents. That one I hate so much. Fine, go ahead and call my mom. They'll even cause a disruption so that they won't have to work or even better, they'll be sent to the office where they can chill for the rest of the period. Yes, my friends, when you send a child away, you have given them the gift of no work. Now, I definitely agree with sending a student to the office if they're being violent, if they are throwing a tantrum and are really disrupting the learning in a big way. But for the most part, when you send them away, you are giving them a get out of jail free. So you might want to give up on these students, you know, the ones who say they don't care, who say your lessons are boring. Yeah, raise your hand if you've heard someone tell you that what you're teaching them is boring, that they're not learning anything, they don't see the point, or maybe they'll even tell you that you're a terrible teacher. And you know, I understand that those little microaggressions, they add up and they can cause some of the best teachers to just throw their hands up in the air and even worse, leave the profession. But you know, if you want to be that teacher that people see in Dangerous Minds or, (laughs) you know, movies about teachers saving lives. If you want to be that teacher that makes a tangible and meaningful impact on your students that loves their job and makes it year after year, you need to set that expectation that work is done. I can tell you from my experience that when you get to that point where students just know what needs to be done, They hustle to get it done because they don't want to have to stay after class and they don't want to be hassled by you. It's actually so freeing because now you have time to go and conference with students instead of babysitting those few that just won't do any work. 
I promise it will work. I keep saying work so much, but it's a method that I've been employing for a while and it does work because the students just know what your expectations are. Now, in the back of your mind, you're like, Kim is saying work a lot and it seems like a lot of work. And you know what? It would be so much easier for me if I just let Eric do nothing and ignored him. And I just gave all of my attention to those students who truly want to learn. And, you know, on those days when he comes to me for English, because I only see him every other day, I would have so much more time to conference with more students if I didn't have to sit down and work with him. Or some of you may be thinking, I should teach him a lesson and let him fail. Here's the thing. At the end of the school day, I am exhausted from giving students constant feedback. I make multiple loops around the classroom. I use random participation methods, such as I have playing cards that I use to call on students. And I listen in on group conversations. And people like Eric really do sap my energy. I'm not going to lie. Those students, man especially if you have multiple in one class, they just take up so much of you. But the work that I put in during class time means that I also have less work to do later. You know, I mentioned in my last episode that I grade less because I'm going around giving in-person feedback. I'm just walking around and I'm monitoring not just Eric, who I will, you know, go and double and triple and quadruple check that he's working, but I walk around and I talk to students. But it means that I don't have to sit down and grade as much later on. So the time that I put in class and the effort that I put in class really pays off in the end. Plus, you know, I get the satisfaction of knowing that I didn't quit on those students that are quitting on themselves. I may possibly be the only person in their life who's that determined to make them learn. If they're resisting so much, who else has given up on them and affirmed their own belief that they are worthless? Think about that. You may be the only person in their whole day who gives them attention. Think about that. And they may love it, even if it's negative attention, but they get to have an adult who seems to care about them. I think that's really powerful. So the bottom line is Eric's not going to get away with doing nothing in my class and neither should your students. And it's not because of, you know, the whole idea of failure is not an option. Some students still may fail, but this is more likely because they're not placed at the proper level, meaning they are in a class that doesn't offer them the kind of support that they need based on their reading and writing levels. But they're not going to fail because I wrote them off as not being worth my time and energy. And it's definitely not because my class is an easy A. I give them plenty of rigor, but also plenty of scaffolds and opportunities for students like Eric to show me what they can do. And it's the fact that at the beginning of the year, I let my students know that no matter what, they will leave my class more knowledgeable and better than when they arrived. And I constantly remind them that I believe in them and I will show them how to believe in themselves as well. So now that we are about a month away from winter break, at least most of us are maybe three to four weeks from winter break, it's time to think about those students who you sort of wrote off as just going to be students who get F's in your class. They put no effort in, they don't do their homework, they don't care you've gotten to the point where maybe you don't care, but it's time to think about what can you squeeze from them? What can you get them to do to demonstrate learning? So it's our job to get them to produce some work. So just think about those students. Maybe, you know, at this point in the year, you can only focus on one or two, or if you're a secondary teacher, maybe one per class, but however many you can handle, Pick out those students who you were going to put in extra effort and get them to work. I'm not saying that you need to pass them necessarily, but you need to get them to work. They can no longer get a free ride in your class. They have to pay up. And how they pay up is by doing the work and demonstrating learning. And you have to be relentless 
and get them to work. You are up there working your butt off to get them to be better students, better citizens, and a better version of themselves. And that shouldn't be cheap. You should not be cheap. Okay, so I gave you a lot to think about for this week, and I'd love to hear from you what you did or if you did anything. I'd also love to hear from you if you don't even agree with me. I always welcome civil discourse, so you might think the complete opposite of what I'm saying today, and I would love to just have that conversation with you. So you can email me at kim at teachersneedteachers.com. And don't forget what I said in the beginning of the podcast. I would just love to hear from you, my listeners. Either way, I would love for you to introduce yourself to me and let me know how you came here, your educational journey, and why you were drawn to this podcast. Hang in there, you guys, and have a great week. Thanks for listening to the Teachers Need Teachers podcast. Love this episode? Head over to Apple Podcast or Google Play to subscribe, rate, and leave a review.